hi 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 welcome to my channel my name is mo and today we're going to be discussing the legal angle of the just concluded elections in nigeria now for context for people who are non-nigerian nigeria has just gone through a very intense presidential election and a lot of people are aggrieved around the irregularities in the process so people are just wondering what exactly does the law say so that's why i'm making this video now I have been putting up travel content for the last what couple of weeks i'm still a digital nomad but i'm also a lawyer and i'm very active in the civic space in nigeria and it just didn't seem true to my values to put out another travel video without talking about something i am comfortably talking about which is the legal angle of the elections now some context right I am a tech lawyer, I'm not an election petition lawyer, so there are definitely lawyers who have a lot more refined views on this issue than I do. So I'm going to try as much as possible not to get into legal analysis. I'll take out the legal jargon and just kind of focus specifically on what the law says, right? And yeah, so law could be long-winded and boring. So one of the things I try to do in this video is arrange my thoughts according to questions so these questions based off what people have asked me personally based off what people are asking you know on social media and i just put them together so we have about 10 questions or 11 questions here i also have my laptop in front of me so i can make reference to the law um and then i would also encourage you to check out the law by yourself um just so you're a lot more informed and if you have any comments like you want to make make them in the comments you know um let's get right into it okay so the first question i have here is what is the specific and important aspect of the amended electoral act now we have a new electoral act and this is <laughs> this is something that is pretty normal in nigeria we've changed our electoral laws a couple of times or i would say adjusted our electoral laws a couple of times now, to give a bit of context, I will tell you about a case, um, a, a case called Wiki and Pedersite. So in that particular case, right, what had happened was the, uh, the petitioner in that case had alleged that INEC did not follow its procedures in using the smart card reader. Now, when that petition got to court, the court was like, hey, the Electoral Act does not make any provisions for smart card readers, so we don't even know what the you know what exactly to do here right and that particular decision left the lacuna um somewhat where it was like people weren't really sure to what extent electronic devices could be used in the elections right because the electoral act as that's then did not provide for such a thing <laughs> so here comes the amended electoral act and the precise section is section 47 and basically section 47 cured the lacuna by you know incorporating electronic devices basically it, it gives the presiding officer you know um the power to use any technological device that has that has been prescribed by INEX. so that's exactly um why a lot of people were excited about the amended electoral act now, speaking of the Electoral Act, another part of the Act actually says that the presiding officers, you know, who are conducting the election on Election Day must record, transmit the votes by the procedure that has been prescribed by INEC. Now, one thing I should dix make a distinction about is that the Electoral Act in itself allows the use of electronic devices but it does not prescribe how those electronic devices would be used what it does is that it gives INEC the power to prescribe the procedure of using those devices and that's exactly what INEC did right so INEC released a couple of regulations around what we know as the beavers and how they are supposed to be used by the presiding officers right okay and for some funny reason, I couldn't find the latest regulations um, from INEC on the use of beavers on their websites, but I was able to source it from a source <laughs> that I trust. 
But before we get into that, one other dis distinction that is important to make is that the Electoral Act lays down a procedure that the polling, um, that the presiding officers are supposed to follow when they are collating the votes, right? And that procedure is very detailed because it says that after the votes have been counted, right, the form would be signed and stamped by the presiding officer, countersigned by the polling agent or the candidates where they are available. The presiding officer shall give the polling agent and the police officer where available a copy of the result sheet. That result sheet would then be taken and the presiding officer would have to announce the results there at the polling unit. Then that result sheet would then be taken to the collating center and the polling agents and the security operatives can follow the presiding officer to the collating center. And the act now goes further to say that if a presiding officer does not follow the law as laid down in the electoral act, he or she might be guilty of a crime and it's liable to conviction of um, not for a term of imprisonment well of at least six months and um, a fine of not more than 500,000 naira. So basically the electoral act creates an offense where the presiding officer does not follow this procedure that I have just raised. Again, this is very different and distinct from if the presiding officer does not, or if INEC in itself does not follow his own regulations, right? The only offense that is created here by the act is the offense of not following the procedure. And that offense is as it relates to presiding officers. Again, that is very, that is a very important distinction that I wanted to make. Now, the electoral act itself is silent on what is going to happen if INEC does not follow its own regulations because the bone of contention here is that INEC has said that this is how the results have are going to be transmitted and that didn't happen right so what exactly is the next step now INEC not following its procedures as laid down is not something that the law has provided for but it's very important because one of the grounds within which an election can be challenged and I'll talk about this later on is that the election was null and void because of corrupt practices and irreg irregularities. So INEC not following its procedures in the transmission of the results, right, can make a strong case for irregularities of elections. Anyways, so that's pretty much it on what um, the new Electoral Act says and why it was important and why a couple of people were excited about the Electoral Act. Are you still with me? Okay, so let's go. Now, so what is the form that was prescribed by INEC? You know, I've said that the Electoral Act gives INEC the flexibility to, um, to decide how the votes are going to be transmitted, just basically the conduct of the transmission and collision of the votes on election day. Now, Article 38 of the guidelines provides as follows, right? On completion of all polling units and voting result procedure, the presiding officer shall electronically transmit the results of the polling units directly to the collation system. Use the beavers to, to upload a scanned copy of the result sheet to the IREF, that's the viewing portal, and then take the beavers and the original copy of each form to the presiding officer um, in the collation ward. Um, so this is what this regulation says, and uh, if INEC does not follow its regulation, it is now left for the courts to interpret that is the procedure, right, outlined by INEC mandatory to be followed, right, and how exactly does it affect the outcome of the election. And that's something that we're just waiting for the courts to decide on, right, since I agree, some agreed parties have gone to court. Again, I'm not giving a legal analysis, I'm just laying down what the law says. So let's continue. Now, the next question here is who appoints the INEC chairman and how does this affect the independence of the body? Now, the INEC chairman, by virtue of section 154 of the 1999 Constitution of Nigeria as amended, the INEC chairman is actually appointed by the president upon the approval of the Senate. The president is also supposed to seek counsel from something called the National Council of State. 
And the National Council of State is basically, um, I will call them an advisory body that is made up of ex-presidents of Nigeria, ex-heads of states, you know, quite different, the statistics governors of um, the Federation, the Attorney General of the Federation, the Senate President, the Speaker of the House of Reps. Anyway, these people form an advisory body that is supposed to advise the president. Now, they don't hold executive functions, but they have persuasive authority, right? Interestingly, um, Yakubu Gowon is currently one of the members of the uh, National Council of States. And the idea of a National Council of States was actually uh, introduced by Mutala Mohammed in the speech where he was deposing Yakubu Gowon. I just thought it was an interesting history um, fact right there. Now, um, to be truly independent, what I believe is that INEC in itself, right, has to not only be independent, in fact, but it has to be seen as independent, right? So we, the people, the, the political participants, everybody needs to see INEC as an independent body. And that would depend on the context around the selection, nomination, um, confirmation, and even the processes around removal of the INEC chairman, right? Because whoever is presiding over that body, especially at the point in our democracy where, you know, things are a little bit um, fragile in the sense that our democracy is very young, right? So it's very, very important that that person is seen as independent. And I do believe, and this is one of those places where I'm giving my opinion, that the uh, the people deserve a lot more um, participation in the appointments and removal of the INEC chairman. I'm not really sure what that form would take, if it would take a form of a referendum or something like that. But if the people lose confidence in the independence of the person who is presiding over something as important as our elections, then there should be a process where the people can express that lack of confidence. You know what I mean? Yeah. So now that if, the next question I have here is now that they've announced the result, what can the aggrieved parties do within the confines of the law? Can different parties sue? Can they come together? Now, different parties can choose to come together to file a suit, although most times you have people filing individual suits. And the reason for this is because the prayers that are being requested from the courts are typically different. So prayers basically is just the orders that you want the courts to make, right? So, um, but parties are free to come together and, you know, file a matter if they basically are praying for the same prayers from the courts. Now, one of the things that is very important is that before you can bring an election pet, um, petition before the courts, there are three grounds upon which that would happen. Number one, that the candidate that was returned as winner was not qualified to context, contest the election. Number two, the election was invalid as a result of corrupt practices or non-compliance with the Electoral Act, all that. And number three, the respondent was not duly elected by majority of the valid, of the valid and lawful vote cast at the election, right? So let me just talk about the second one a little bit. So one of the things that I had just discussed earlier was that, you know, um, there, there seems to be a lot of evidence in the public domain that INEC did not follow its own procedures. Now, for, for an aggrieved party to be able to make a strong argument, they would have to rely on this particular piece, which says that the election was invalid as a result of corrupt practices or non-compliance with the electoral acts right and one of the things that we can you know i guess show um when you're thinking about um you know uh, corrupt practices is the fact that number one there seems to be a lot of evidence of tampered you know result sheets right where the result sheets that were taken at the polling units right were not the same as what was uploaded on the IREV. And this is a corrupt practice, right? This is an irregularity. This is something that 
where there's strong evidence of it is one of the grounds upon which the courts can nullify an election are you still with me hopefully now the next question here is that if the agreed parties decide that they don't want to go to court right can me me that i have gone to vote and stand on online in queues and i have traveled from everywhere can i say that you know what i want to do something about it i know you're passionate right but the truth is no there's nothing you can do about it other than put i guess um you know pressure on whatever our machineries of justice we have to do the right thing right and by pressure i just mean people just constantly talking about the fact that no this is not right and it should not stand the reason why you can't do anything within the confines of the law is that the electoral act says that the only people who can challenge an election are a candidate a can someone who was a candidate in that election right and the person actually participated in the election so you could be a candidate and you didn't participate if you didn't participate in the election then you cannot file a petition the second round the second person who can bring a petition is a political party that had a candidate that participated in the election so again that's why when you see election petitions you typically see that the political parties and then the aggrieved parties are usually you know the petitioners so those are the two people that have what lawyers like to call locus locus standing to bring an election petition so yes now the next question here is who exactly are the aggrieved parties going to sue INEC as a body, the chairman, or the party whose candidate was declared as winner. Now, according to the Electoral Act, right, a person who is declared as winner should always be joined as a respondent in the suit. Now, for those who don't know, um, the respondent is the person who is being, um, who the petition is against, right? So if I'm bringing the petition before a court, I'm the petitioner and the respondent is the person in this case who was declared winner. So the respondent should always be um, listed as a party. So again, when you look at some of the court documents, you would see that the respondent would be listed as a party. INEC would be listed as a party as well. Now, speaking of the INEC chairman, one of the things that um, is also important is that if you sue a, according to the Electoral Act, right, if you sue an official of the, um, you know, of, of the INEC, based off something they were doing while they were actually working for INEC, then INEC would indemnify, indemnify them, right, for any, um, I guess, orders or fines or anything that the courts, um, you know, grants or something like that. except where a crime has been committed, but I'll talk about that later. Now, um, one of the things that, uh, one of the things uh, that is also very important to note is that in terms of the provisions of legal services, because the next question I have here is who provides legal services um, for the INEC, the Attorney General of States, the Attorney General of the Federation basically are supposed to represent INEC because INEC is, um, is, is basically an agency of the federal government, right? But also by the Electoral Act, INEC has the power to get representation of private practitioners, which are lawyers. And in that case, um, those people who represent INEC will be paid, you know, the Electoral Act calls it a, an honorarium or, an, or a, yeah, or something else that has been approved by INEC. So whatever fees they charge will be approved by INEC. Now who pays for it? Is it going to be my taxpayers' money after INEC has been sued? The truth is yes, because INEC is an agency of the federal government. So they have a budget that is approved by the federal government. In fact, by the new electoral act, that um, their budget is supposed to be approved at least one year before the elections. I haven't seen the internal disbursement of funds or of INEC or how they apportion their budget. But I want to believe that legal services, for instance, um, would be included in, in the budget, right? Or potential legal services. So yes, that money actually comes from the coffers of obviously of the government. Um, now, what court is going to preside over the case? Now, this is an interesting situation. Uh, in Nigeria, we have different uh, structures 
depending on the particular election that is being contested right so if let's start with the um the house of assembly right so for the house of assembly and so i'm talking about the national and state house of assembly you actually have a tribunal that is set up and these tribunals are typically set up um uh, set up um on the state level right and then they have the high court judges i think it's about three high court judges right that preside over this tribunal now after the tribunal has made its decision right that would go that would go as an appeal to um the court of appeal and then the whatever decision that the court of appeal makes is final in that case so basically that tells us now for lawmakers there's one level of, of, of appeal right so you have the election tribunal and then you have the court of appeal now for governorship elections right you also um you also have election tribunals but then after the election tribunal has made its decision the appeal can go to the court of appeal now if the petitioner is like hey i don't like what the court of appeal did here right then they can now go to the supreme court so the difference is that for governorships you have two for governorship elections you have two levels of, of appeal you have at the court of appeal stage and then you have at the supreme court now let's get to presidential which is what you want to hear for the presidential if you've looked at any of the suits you will see that um they have been filed in the court of appeal and that's because for the presidential there's no tribunal per se right what you have is the court of appeal sitting i guess as a tribunal but it's a court right it's an election um, petition court and the court of appeal has original jurisdiction for um for petitions that relate to the presidential elections and then after the court of appeal makes its decision that would go to the supreme court on the um, appeal stage so you have one level of appeal so basically for governorships are the only ones that have two levels of appeal now you're wondering you're like has this ever happened before yes actually nigeria's first uh, elections um which was conducted in 1979 right ended up in court and then you had um Aulawa, it's our officer shagari and that particular case actually ended up in the supreme court although you know this structure was a little, a little bit differently um, in 1979, obviously. Now, the next question I have here is, on what grounds can an election petition be brought? Number one, I've said this before, right, that the candidate was not qualified to contest in the election, that the election was invalid as a result of corrupt practices or non-compliance with the Electoral Act, that the respondent was not duly elected by majority of the lawful vote cast at the election so if you're a petitioner that you qualify <laughs> as a petitioner right you can bring an election petition based off any of these grounds now the next question here is what do you think are the aggrieved party's strongest argument to me the strongest argument here is that the election was invalid as a result of corrupt practices really and that the rest well that's the strongest argument here now um the argument of 25 percent in the fct we'll get to that later actually we can just talk about it now but i'm going to talk about it really briefly because there's a lot of um communication around it already now the electoral act says that before you are before you can be Actually, sorry, not the Electoral Act. The Constitution says that before you can be declared winner in the presidential election, you must have majority of the lawful vote cast, like, you know, majority, obviously. And then you must have 25% um, of the vote cast in two-thirds of the states of the Federation and the FCC. So the bone of contention is because that particular provision says and the F FCT, must the winner have 25% in the FCT, right? Also note that the same constitution in section 299, right, had also had listed or said that it had granted the FCT the status of a state. So if the FCT is already being granted the status of a state, then why was the FCT specifically mentioned in this particular provision? Now there are different arguments. One of the arguments is that hey, it's absurd why should the FCT be given a veto, right? But a counter argument to that also is that 
Yes, of course, because the FCC doesn't have a governor per se. Um, they, so it only makes sense that the president, who kind of rules them directly through a minister, obviously, because the president appoints the minister, should be somebody that they like or somebody that they approve of. So if not up to 25 people in a particular geographical location approve of this person, then why should that person be ruling them indirectly or not? So now this is something again that has not really thoroughly been tested in court. I mean, we have snippets here and there, but specifically, you know, this is an issue that people still argue both sides on. For me, and this is one of those places where I give my personal opinion, I do think that the, um, the law should be interpreted literally, right? The literal interpretation of the law says an FCC, so it makes sense, an FCC. An FCC. Now, um, the next question I have is here is, if an aggrieved party wins in court, what kind of orders can the court make? Number one, the court can uphold the election. Now, going back to Awolowo and Shagari again, in that particular case, the court actually held, upheld the election. And I'm going to talk about this at the end because when I was reading the judgment of that case, ah, it pained me. Um, but I'll talk about it towards the end. And then the second thing that the court can do is that the court can nullify the election and call for a new election, which in Nigeria's case is going to be super expensive. Then number three, very interesting, the announcement of INEC can be rejected and the person announced as winner is replaced by the person petitioning. I'm sure you're just wondering that. I'm sorry, what? Yes. Now we have something similar, not on the presidential level, but if you're a lawyer, you probably already know the case I'm talking about. And the case is Amechi versus INEC. So just to give you a brief of what had happened in that case, um, Amechi was running for governorship elections under the PDP and he had won the PDP primaries, right? So after winning the PDP primaries with a landslide, he won it by almost 100% of the votes that were to be casted for that particular primaries. Somehow, internal disagreements within the PDP led them to substitute his name as the candidate to INEC. Now, this was after they had submitted Amici's name as their governorship candidate for River State, you know, and then they substituted his name. And what happened was the person they substituted his name with, Omeha, actually did not even run for the primaries, right? And then, um, Technically, he was the one who ran for the election, won the election, and was sworn in as governor. And then Amechi was like, no, 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 this cannot happen. So Amechi, um, content, his, his main issue um, was that the substitution itself was not validly done. It was done without an order of court. And then PDP had given him some very flimsy excuse for that substitution. I think they said it was a clerical error or something like that. Anyways, um, Amechi fought it up until the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court held in that particular case that yes, the substitution was invalid. Because the substitution was invalid, the rightful candidate for the PDP for the governorship elections in River State was Amechi. And based off that, since PDP went ahead to win the elections, Amechi should be the person that will be sworn in as governor because he was the rightful candidate of the PDP. Now, to state that the Supreme Court has also departed from certain parts of its ruling in that case, but this was what happened in that particular case. And then it was like, Omeha, oh yeah, oh yeah, you are in the government house, but you need to leave because there's a new sheriff in town. And then so Omeha left the government house and then um, Amechi was sworn in as governor and that was what happened in that case. But just to give you historical context that there have been cases where the courts have actually replaced the candidates that won. Now, I was also going to say that um, the decisions of the Supreme Court generally are not perfect because even from time to time, the Supreme Court would depart from certain parts of its previous rulings and even on the presidential level, right? One particular case I want to talk about, which I had mentioned earlier, is Awolowo versus Shagari. And that, no, yeah, Awolowo versus Shagari, yes. And that particular case was came from the first presidential elections in Nigeria, actually, in 1979. So what had happened in that case was that Nigeria's first um, presidential elections, everyone was excited. There were a couple of candidates, and then Shagari was declared winner of the election. There were a lot of other candidates aside from Awolowo, but Awolowo was the closest to Shagari in terms of, you know, position of the total votes that were casted. 
And then I wonder what was like, no. According to the military decree, there was a military decree then because Nigeria again was just coming out of the um, military rule. And the, elect the military decree, which was the electoral decree at the time, had said that for a candidate to be returned as winner of the presidential elections, right, the person must win a majority of the lawful vote casted, right, overall. And then the person must also win at least 25% of the vote casted in at least um two thirds of the federation does that sound very familiar it is familiar because a lot of our laws today are still fashioned after our military decrees or extensions of our military decrees or amended or, or amendments of our military decrees and that's why our legal system is still you know the is, is, is one of the core problems of our legal system today but that's you know a whole different issue back to this and then, so that was Aulawa's main bone of contention, right? So it went to the um, sup Supreme Court. It first started with the tribunal. And then at the tribunal stage, the tribunal was like, hey, um, no, you don't, have, you don't have a case. And to give you context, at that time, Nigeria had 19 states in the Federation. So that would mean two-thirds of 19 would mean 12.6. And then Aulawa's contention was like, hey, there is nothing like a fractional state, so the 0.6 must be seen as a full state. And the tribunal was like, no, we disagree with that reasoning. 0.6 is two-thirds, and two-thirds really must be two-thirds of that state. So for a candidate to meet the requirements of the final state, the candidate only has to have 25% of two-thirds of the votes that are being casted that that were casted in that state i hope that makes sense um anyways so i was like okay even with that your reasoning right so it means that if you're going to calculate um the amount of shares that shagari has right um, in kano which was the final state you need to scale down since you're scaling down the total votes in kano um by one third to make two thirds right you need to scale down the number of votes that Shagari scored in Kano by um, two thirds, by one third, to make two thirds. Because that's what the principle of mathematics, whatever is done to side A is done to side B. And uh, this tribunal was like, no. So what the tribunal did was that even if they scale down the total number of votes in Kano in order to calculate if Shagari won 25% in Kano, they used the total number of votes that Shagari got in Kano instead of scaling it down also um, to two thirds. I hope that makes sense. And Aula was like, your math is not mathing, so I'm going to go to the Supreme Court. And then, strangely, at the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court failed to rule that the tribunal misdirected itself. The Supreme Court actually aligned itself with the tribunal and their absurd, 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 absurd calculation. Because when I was reading that particular judgment, I was like, this doesn't make any sense. But it was something that gave me hope, right? There was actually a dissenting judgment, which was brilliantly written. And I aligned, I, I aligned myself with that, with that dissent judgment. But generally, just go read that case. Very, very interesting. I actually miss when, um, you know, really thought-provoking arguments like this came from our supreme court and i can't wait for us to get back there anyway in rounding up this video i want to say that i understand that um some of you might be discouraged or demoralized because you know you feel that something has been taken away from you and that is valid honestly that is valid right um it took me a couple of days to put myself together so i ca I, I, und I understand what you might be feeling but one thing i want to say is that the reason why we know that there were a lot of irregularities with the last um, elections was because all of us were there right everybody was there i mean even if you were not there physically you were you were you know monitoring what was going on people people stood in line people sat from the back of at back of trucks to get to their polling units people traveled people came from grad school like you know there were so people were given i like materials when they ran out of materials somebody um, donated headlamps for INEC to count the votes when it got dark. Everybody was engaged. So that one vote really counts. And so if you're on the fence about if you should go out to vote on Saturday, um, what I would say, though, is that please go out to vote. Your one vote really 
matters your one vote is the what is the reason why we can beat our chest and say no um this uh, election was irregular on the face of it and yeah we demand better as a people right so please go out to vote and i still post travel content generally so if you are interested in any of that subscribe to my channel um thank you for watching till the end and yeah um you know leave any comments you know um observations contributions in the comments i'll really be in the comments actually and just responding and thank you for watching peace